The only covenant that currently that God is honoring is the one he has with his son that he perfectly, perfectly accomplished. And it's so wonderful and beautiful, he doesn't need to add to that. So where do we come into this? is probably one of the most profound teachers of our day. I hope that you will plug in and that you'll really listen. You guys please stand again and let's like cheer and scream and be crazy. And would you welcome Dr. Jonathan Welton. So we're gonna start in verse 21, Galatians 4, verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman, the other by the free woman. These things are being taken figuratively. He's laying out a metaphor. Abraham has two sons. These two sons come from two different women. So you have Sarah and Isaac and the heavenly Jerusalem and the new covenant. Then over here, we have Hagar, Ishmael, the first century Jerusalem, which is persecuting the Christians, and the Old Covenant. There are people, and there's a whole realm of theology called covenant theology. And it says there's a very thin line between the Old and New Covenant, and we carry things over from the Old Covenant. We do keep the Old Testament, but we throw out the Old Covenant. That slave woman will never share in the inheritance with the free woman. So the Old Covenant has to go, but not the Old Testament. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, these things were written down as examples for us. Covenant theology it holds the idea that the Bible is one giant unit. They don't look at covenants as individual. As they see them more as building one on top of another. And they would see the new covenant as stacked on top of the old. And so they drag certain things from the old into the new, and Paul would have rebuked them for trying to keep the slave woman. And I'll show you some of his other rebukes because they're just as brutal. But... He approaches it this way, and there's a strong division in his mind. There's really, there's two major ways of thinking about covenant in the Protestant church. One is called covenant theology. The other is called dispensational theology. And part of what happens with that, you might hear a preacher who says, do you know what the most important page in the Bible is? And his answer would be, the blank piece of paper between the Old and New Testaments. But that idea, that is a picture of dispensational theology that pits the Old Testament versus the New Testament. That's got these two in such a contrast that this is law and this is grace. When we hear people talk about law versus grace, that is when we're hearing dispensational talk. There's, there's not actually a war between law and grace in Scripture. What we actually see is a war between law versus faith. The law was the Mosaic Code, and faith was what we see from Abraham. And when Paul fights these fights in Romans 4 or James in, in the book of James, the contrast is between are you going to live by faith or are you going to live by the law? And if you live by faith, then grace comes. If you live by the law, you're going to fail. So the actual war is between law and faith, but we got all confused along the way. So what happens in the dispensational thing is you end up throwing out the Old Testament to a degree, and that's not the goal either. We do want to throw out the slave woman. We don't want to throw out the Old Testament. So what we have here is, is an important divide that we have to get a hold of. Um, Paul talks about this as well in 2 Corinthians 3, if you'd like to join me over there. 
In 2 Corinthians 3, he says, we'll start in verse 1, are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So he's got a contrast going, written on human hearts versus written on stone. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Now zero in on this verse. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? He's saying if you go back to Moses, there was a level of glory that came with him receiving the old covenant from God, and it had a transitory, a fading glory to it. And if even that terrible covenant, which was a ministry of death, it kills and does not bring life, if that came with glory, how much more glory is going to come with the new covenant? It's a great point, Paul. It's a good word. Also, where it talks about ministers, there's about seven or eight places in, scripture, in the New Testament that talk about us being ministers. Usually it says ministers of the gospel or ministers of the good news. This is the only place that actually tells you what the gospel and what the good news is. It's the new covenant. That you've been made ministers of the new covenant. But if we don't know what the new covenant is, we are going to be lacking in our understanding of the gospel and the good news itself. So I want us to end up being competent ministers of the new covenant. Does that make sense? This is one of my, my main goals that we grab onto, because this is healthy stuff. There's one other place in uh, Hebrews chapter 8. Now, we don't know if Paul wrote that or if it was somebody else, but in Hebrews chapter 8, it's written, it says in verse 8, but God found fault with the people and said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. It will not be like. That is quite a helpful statement. This one over here, ministry of death, letter that kills it is the slave woman who has to be cast out, and the new one will be nothing like what I made with your ancestors. Why? Because the new one is a grant covenant. The new one is not like the kinship or the vassal covenant that fell apart under Moses, this, this concept over here. What relates to the earthly Jerusalem here, the New Testament refers to the New Covenant as a new Jerusalem. That's what we just saw in Galatians chapter 4. This New Covenant is a new Jerusalem. One of the things that we have, uh, I'll call it like, a, like an urban legend that we grew up with in the church, is that nobody could ever keep the law. So Jesus came, and he was the first one to keep the law. What actually happens, though, when we believe this is it distorts our view of the Father, and it's not accurate. Now, I want to show you this. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, he tells, this, uh, he tells them of the law. He's written out the vassal covenant. He's giving them the book of rules. That's actually what Deuteronomy translates to book of the law. It's a book of laws. It is the stipulations that come with receiving a vassal covenant. And he says in chapter 30, verse 11, Now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. 
It's not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart so that you may obey it. This is pretty challenging to our concept that we've created. I would like to uh, jar this loose a little bit because if we think about this, if the father, I'm a father, I have two young daughters, if I said to my two-year-old, uh, here is a cinder block in the yard, and if you don't carry it from this side of the yard to you know, 100 feet away to the other side of the yard, then I will burn you in hell forever. <laughs> I am giving her a law that she is an impossible task. So literally, she cannot do it. And what we have taught ourselves to believe from certain theology perspectives is that the father gave a law that nobody could keep. What kind of father would he be if that were true? So he did not give an impossible law, and he said, I didn't give you an impossible law. I gave you a very attainable law. Also, one of the things that, that we miss when we look at the law, some people go back to uh, Deuteronomy or, or the, the Old Testament, and they try to grab those, uh, those specific rules and say that this is God's ideal. Also not true. God's ideal is the Garden of Eden before the fall. There's no book of laws and rules there. There's don't eat the fruit. Can you put a tire swing in the tree? Yes, you can. Can you have a food fight with the fruit? Yes, you can. Don't chew it and swallow it. Like, that's very specific. You can do almost anything else in this garden. And we've gotten to the point where it's like we'll put a cage around the tree and then the tree branches will grow a little too far, so we'll put another cage around that. And we, we build this insulated approach, and it's a way to call it freedom, right? Freedom and safety. Mostly safety. When his approach was, here's one, one thing. Don't chew and swallow this fruit. Okay. So this concept of... of um, this concept of the laws, they weren't actually meant to get unregenerated Israelites back to the Garden of Eden. It's not God's perfect ideal that these are the laws that represent his heart. We talked about last night, the veiling of God that his heart wasn't able to be seen any longer. But what we do see in the Old Testament is that the law is actually revealed that the, the wisdom of the God of the Israelites. So if you go back, uh, there was in that same time period a nearby people who had the Code of Hammurabi. The Code of Hammurabi has 283 laws. Now the law in the Old Testament has 613, but in the laws of the Code of Hammurabi, it would have, some, uh, I think there was 12 different laws that included mutilation. If you stole something, they're going to chop your hand off. In the code of the Israelites, if you stole something, you had to pay back the person four times over. So there was a wisdom that was revealed to the other people. And there was an understanding, too, that, you know, sometimes people are starving and they steal bread. If they get caught, they will have to work and pay it back and so you should employ them and make them work for you enough that they can pay it back four times over, which for a poor person who has no job and is starving, that's actually a good deal. I can get a job from this person and pay them back and actually get back on my feet. This is a real positive rather than losing your hand. So there was wisdom included, but... Is it God's ideal that we have people who are stealing and people who are starving? No. So the law isn't meant to actually get us back to the Garden of Eden, but it was laws that would work in that society that were a step up, but not a step to such a place that unregenerated 
Old Testament people that if they could follow it, they would be perfect and just be like Jesus. We've got, we, we turn the whole thing into a dialogue about salvation. If anyone could ever perfectly keep the law, then they get to go to heaven. So nobody ever kept the law before Jesus, according to what we said a few minutes ago. So nobody in the Old Testament ever went to heaven. I mean, that's the natural conclusion of where we started, is that if nobody ever kept the law before Jesus and you had to perfectly keep the law to get into heaven, then King David, uh, bummer. Plus, you get these verses that throw a wrench in the whole thing, like uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, it talks about Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, and it says that he was blameless according to the law. Wait, what? Yeah, that's what it says. Or we have uh, the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. And he says, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you follow the law. And he gives him a few law examples. And he says, I've, I've kept all that since I was a child. He says, okay, so you go sell everything you have and come follow me. Now, that's not in the law. Rich people not having to sell everything and come follow Jesus. That's not a law. He comes up with something on the spot to deal with this young man's issue. But you'd think if Jesus had the theology we have, then nobody's ever kept the law. He'd be like, nope, you're going to burn because see how arrogant you are? You think you've kept the law. He would have addressed something about the fact that, no, you haven't kept the law. Nobody's kept the law. That's why I'm here. <laughs> but he doesn't correct that because that wasn't the issue. So then in Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about himself and he says that according to the law, he was flawless. This, this approach is, is just so shocking to think, wait a minute, so people could keep the law. Now, what we've done is we've injected our 2,000 years later New Covenant understanding into the first century. And the problem with that is, well, a lot of things. But what happens in this case is that we actually run into uh, us inputting salvation into the law. You can read the book of Deuteronomy. You can read Exodus. You can read Numbers. You can read Deuteronomy. You're not going to find salvation based on the law. We've injected that concept. And, and the problem with that is that we're still attaching law to our salvation. We're still doing the same thing. And yet, law didn't have... When, when God gave them the conditions of the law and says, if you obey, you will be blessed. If you disobey, you will be cursed. These are the conditions of the law. Obey and be blessed. Disobey and be cursed. Obey and be blessed means your harvests are going to be fruitful, your cows are going to be happy, you're going to have lots of children, you're going to have lots of land, you're going to win your battles. But happy cows does not equate to salvation. The best that you can have is be obedient like Zacharias or the rich young ruler or Paul the Pharisee, Saul the Pharisee, and that's the best you can do, and you can have your happy cows and die and could still go to hell, perhaps. But it wasn't about salvation. The law-keeping was not about salvation. It was about being blessed or cursed. We inject salvation into it, but that's not what's going on in the old. That's not what's going on in the old covenant. Salvation was always based on faith. This is why you have Pharisees standing in front of Jesus in Matthew 23, and they are perfect keepers of the law. They keep all the rules, and they're missing Jesus right in front of them. 
And he's like, you guys, you tithe on your dill and your cumin. You are tithing on your herbs to be perfect. And I'm right here. And you're missing love and mercy and grace. You're missing the more important things. So that this has been a challenge from, day, from the very beginning, is, is picking law over faith. And the way that Paul unwraps the new covenant is he's saying, look, Father Abraham and the faith is actually what attaches us to the new covenant. It's not the, the law keeping that attaches you to it, which would be the mosaic way of attaching. He says we have to attach the same way that Abraham does. We talked about last night uh, the kinship covenant ceremony and how the two kings would take their tablets and go back and build an ark and put the ark in the temple of their god, and the god would be the enforcer of that covenant uh, relationship. When we get to the New Testament, we struggle with this, this concept of who did he give the new covenant to? Did he give it to the Jews? Did he give it to the Gentiles? Did he give it to the church? Did he give it to the 12 disciples at Passover? Uh, there's lots of discussion and debate about this. But a new covenant was actually formed at the cross between the Father and the Son. And the writer of Hebrews is the one who really makes it the most clear for us in Hebrews chapter 5 when he talks about Jesus being the high priest of our new covenant. And you could read all of the book of Hebrews is about this covenant exchange. And he, he shows that Jesus is greater than angels. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than the old sanctuary. He went into the heavenly sanctuary. Jesus is greater than is the theme of Hebrews. But as far as covenant goes, he's, he shows that the mediator of the old covenant was Moses. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. Here's where it's different. When Moses stands... Before God, he's the mediator, and behind him, represented by him, is the nation of Israel. So, sometime in the future, there's a, forming, there's a forming at that time of the old covenant between the mediator Moses, who represents the Israelites and nobody else. So then, later, the family of God, the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are sitting at the kitchen table. And they're having a discussion. How are we going to make this new covenant? If we go down, if we just offer a new covenant and we give it to these people, they'll probably fail just as bad as the Israelites did because we didn't regenerate them. We can't just hand them a new covenant. So what do we need to do? And Jesus raises his hand. This is, this is all apocrypha. <laughs> Jesus raises his hand and says, I can go down there and put on humanity, put on flesh. I'll stand on the other side of the deal. And I'll be God still, but I'll also, I'll be a human. I'll represent all of humanity. So no longer is he coming just as one nation's representative, He's coming as a human to represent all of humanity. Now, he technically couldn't do this because he was born from the tribe of Judah, not from the tribe of Levi. So he couldn't be a priest. He couldn't be a mediator. He couldn't have direct access to God, which was very intentional. So instead of putting him inside the Levite tribe and forming some new old covenant... He drops him, himself, his essence, into a Judah, tribe of Judahite. And now, as a representative from that, he's free of representing the old covenant. This is why even in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 7, there was a debate going on in the early church that was saying Jesus couldn't be our high priest because he's from the tribe of Judah. He's not from Levi. And so the argument goes, the writer of Hebrews makes the argument, yeah, but he's not a Levite priest because he's actually a priest from the order of Melchizedek. And that Abraham had Levi in his loins. So Abraham's greater than Levi. 
and Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, so Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, and Jesus is coming straight out of Abraham, or straight out of Melchizedek. So he's, he's greater than Melchizedek, Abraham, and Levi. So he's from a whole other system. He's outside the system, and so he can represent all of humanity. So he shows up and stands on one side of this. God the Father stands on the other side of this, and they decide, you know what? To make this really perfect, instead of having a, an animal sacrifice, because maybe it'll have a spot or a wrinkle or some blemish or something, Jesus, how about you be the high priest and you be the lamb sacrifice? So he becomes the lamb sacrificed, and then he comes, raises himself back to life. Then, as the high priest, he takes his own blood as the lamb sacrifice and goes through the heavens to the heavenly tabernacle and seals the deal on the Ark of the New Covenant. In Revelation 11, it says that there were thunderings and lightnings in heaven and that they, they saw the Ark of the Covenant. That is not the Ark of the Covenant that got lost to Babylon in 586 B.C. This is the Ark of the New Covenant between the Father and Son, and the Son, the high priest mediator, takes the blood of his own animal lamb sacrifice, takes it through to heaven, and puts it on the lid of an Ark that you don't have access to. So this is how the new covenant was created between the Father and the Son. Now that's a really challenging thought because the weirder, more fringy parts of charismatic world talk about America having a covenant with God. They talk about all kinds of covenants that aren't in Scripture, that don't actually exist except in our imagination. The only covenant that currently that God is honoring is the one he has with his son that he perfectly, perfectly accomplished. And it's so wonderful and beautiful, he doesn't need to add to that. So where do we come into this? By marriage. The, we are the bride, and the bride and the son, the two become one and through his covenant with the Father, we receive the benefits of his covenant with the Father. We receive it through this marriage. Through that union, we receive the benefits. That changes the whole thing because in the past, for some of us, covenant has been a burden. Like I'm trying to keep up my end. Yeah, ever have, you know, some, some some of the thoughts of uh, uh, covenant breaker, you know, even that term. You can't. That's the great news. You can't be a covenant breaker. You can be in Christ or you can be in Adam. That's your choice nowadays. You can be in Christ or you can be in Adam. That's your choice. But the covenant is untouchable. The covenant is unchangeable. You don't have influence or impact on the covenant that Jesus has with the Father. It's great news. Because you can't mess it up. <laughs>